This is terrifying. This isn't from a Halloween movie. It isn't from a guy in a mask in a slasher film. This is 1993's Jurassic Park. It's no secret that what Jurassic Park did was bring to life the visualization of dinosaurs through groundbreaking technology and CGI. But what it also brought to life is true terror. While the entire franchise is built to be a survival thriller, what it brought was the fusion of another genre with it. This is something that Patrick Willems has expertly touched on as well. Similar to 1979's Alien, which morphed together both sci-fi and horror in a way you wouldn't be corrected, considering it one or the other, Jurassic Park brought to life the thrilling excitement of action and surprised audiences with a real sense of horror. Unsurprising that both succeeded in essentially the same era of film. Throughout the entire film, we see not only sequences that would scare most young audience members, but are also strung along through sequences that we typically see in slasher films through action set pieces. See, Jurassic Park is a thinly veiled horror movie, one that has no clear-cut villain. Not sure who to blame here, the dinosaurs themselves for wreaking havoc, the scientists who brought the dinosaurs to life, the dinosaur fanatic who funded everything for no expense, or the parks technicians who sabotaged the entire park system to make some quick cash selling dino DNA. Shorter answer is all of the above. There's no clear-cut Freddy or Jason. But this allows the film to be a lot less predictable than those aforementioned movies when it comes to pointing the finger and establishing who and what to fear. Everything and everyone just mentioned plays an ambiguous right and wrong moral and ethical role in the process of creation and solving of the narrative problems. And then it's you, the viewer, who has to lay the blame and decide who the real bad guy is for the two hour runtime. But you do know what scares you. The real horror comes in how the film stages and connects each individual scene with that perfect balance of life impending terror and seemingly peaceful moments shrouded in a cloak of danger. So let's discuss discuss what some of those scenes look like and break down how they play out. We'll start with the most famous scene from the franchise, the first appearance of the T-Rex. While most of the main cast is out on the tour throughout the park within the self-driving vehicles, the computer system's malfunctions and park security systems go offline. Characters are split between two of the cars with the two kids and the lawyer in the front car and Dr. Alan Grant, Dr. Malcolm and the car following. The weather is getting increasingly worse on the island as a tropical cyclone strikes during their visit. The cars sit waiting in the pouring rain. The only ambiance that you will hear at this point, no tension rising music, no build up, just the sound sound of thunder and rain. A sound you recognize with no dressing. The scene sets itself visually with a goat inside of the fence left as food for something big. As the kids mess around in the front car, annoying and uptight lawyer, we hear our first unfamiliar sound that echoes from a distance. Tim then explains that he's a little confused about what he's hearing, which allows the audience a moment to take in that the noise we just heard, the one causing the ground to shake, is unfamiliar to them as well. As we start hearing it a little bit more, a little bit louder, Tim notices that a cup of water is rippling when the sound is made. The most famous shot in almost any film from this decade. The background rain is slowly fading out as we focus on just the sound from said distance. As the thunderous sound ramps up, the lawyer takes notice of it again. Tim looks through the night vision goggles and notices the goat is no longer on the chain it was on before, and right as Lex asks where the goat is, one of its legs lands on the sunroof of their vehicle. We cut to a dinosaur arm slowly pulling away from the fence with a danger 10,000 volts warning sign, clearly showing us that the power is out. But it doesn't just tell us that, it shows us who's in real danger here. Then, from the view of the car, we see the large head of the T-Rex slowly rise from the foliage as she eats the remainder of the goat in one bite before turning directly towards the car outside of the fence. The lawyer then runs out of the car in the panic, abandoning the kids, heads for the bathroom right alongside the tour tracks. I guess when you gotta go, you gotta go. The next sound we hear on top of that rain is the creaking of the fence. The kids look around to see why, and in full view we see the massive T-Rex has bitten through it and proceeds to walk out onto the track, proclaiming her dominance with a loud roar. All this tension filled up with nothing but minuscule sounds, slow plotting visual cues, and the feeling of knowing that something is gonna happen but having no idea when how or why. All of those elements are exactly what makes up the most tension-filled scenes of slasher films, of a Halloween movie, of a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It's silence, sound, slow realization, and terror, in that order. Almost the antithesis of what you'd normally get from an action-filled blockbuster. Continuing the scene, Dr. Alan Grant states that the T-Rex's vision is based on movement and to stay absolutely still. Then cuts back to the kids by themselves in the front car frantically moving around and turning on a flashlight. The dinosaur focuses attention on them and begins to investigate what the light is. Tim notices the front driver's side door is still open from the lawyer and quickly slams it close. This causes the T-Rex to instantly glare into the car and eventually get the light of the flashlight directly shined into its eyes. T-Rex roars, the kids move once again, and the T-Rex violently begins attacking the car, breaking the sunroof glass as a piece of it becomes the only barrier between the T-Rex and the kids. The car is then flipped over and stomped on as the kids are fighting for their lives, and the car begins to sink into the ground as the rain has turned most of the dirt into mud. And we have 
our climax. See, good horror does what we just saw here. It quietly, not bombastically, builds tension. It shows the threat, it shows the power of the threat, and then it lets you sit in it. It lets you fear it before finally exploding. That is Horror 101, not Action Movie 101. Finally, Grant and Malcolm both take turns distracting the T-Rex with flares while chasing Malcolm. There's a crash into the bathroom that breaks apart completely, revealing the lawyer. And to show that yes, there are real consequences here to the horror that's being built up and not everyone will make it out alive, that the danger is serious, to amplify that fear and provide a period at the end of the sentence, the T-Rex eats the lawyer. Not off screen, not hidden by a camera angle, just straight up eats him. And from there, well, chaos breaks out. The horror leads to carnage, like all good horror does, but more importantly, like all good action movies do. This is where the barrier between horror and action is broken down and we get this mesh that feels like survival, which is an action movie trope. As a T-Rex spins a car around and attempts to eat children, we have the excitement of watching a dinosaur go to work while also fearing for the lives of young people, because someone was just eaten in a very slasher movie kind of way. Again, look at the most recent Halloween movies. That eating of the man in the bathroom is meant to provide some semblance of comedic relief to this moment, which is a very modern horror and slasher thing to do. Another scene that is similar and maybe a little bit less impactful, but still important nonetheless is the raptor scene. Raptors throughout the series of Jurassic Park have time and time again proven they may be a bigger threat than even the T-Rex. Here we see Dr. Ellie Sattler heading towards the power station to reboot the power. She's accompanied by this guy right here, a skilled hunter to watch Watch her back on her trek over there. At the start of this journey, they notice the Velociraptors have broken free of their cage and moments before reaching the power station, they spot that something is stalking them. They're at least fixated on what appears to be a raptor tracking their movements. He instructs Ellie to run quickly to the power station as he takes on the raptor threat. Classic action movie trope of distract and accomplish. Once in the power station, she turns on said power, catching the attention of a raptor, then bursts through the pipes behind her trying to, well, do what the T-Rex did. On her escape, after trapping it behind a chain link door, she breathes a sigh of relief. She's then greeted with a hand on her shoulder, which we know is Ray Arnold's, which we then instantly find is no longer attached to his body. This time we got the reverse. Action, pause, horror. Cutting back here in this tense standoff before he can pull the trigger, another raptor peeks his head out from the bushes. He utters clever girl as it proceeds to jump out at him from those bushes and kills him. Raptors hunt in packs. Here we do get our suspenseful music, the ambiance, all underscoring the effectiveness of just how fast the raptors are, how they hunt, work in numbers, as opposed to the larger, slower T-Rex who hunts at its leisure. This is a moment of Jurassic Park understanding horror within the constructs of action. The raptor and the T-Rex are two different kinds of enemies and they're treated differently. Whereas the T-Rex is a slow build of terror and tension, the raptors are fast, heart pounding, pause, jump scare. Once again, another scene constructed like a slasher film. And the last scene we'll discuss here is what I feel sums up the horror elements of Jurassic Park, maybe better than any other scene. The final raptor scene that follows the previous one, where we see the kids in what finally seems to be a safe environment within the park's main accommodations area. While eating desserts, Lex is struck silent while shaking uncontrollably, noticing a silhouette, which happens to be a dinosaur approaching on the other side of the wall behind Tim. Walking past the actual drawing of a velociraptor on the wallpaper, symbolizing the threat that they are about to face, they think on their feet, they run into the kitchen and hide behind one of the counters. We see through the circular window on the door, the snout of a raptor breathing. We are then told by Ellie that there are only two raptors out there left as one is contained, unless it can open doors. Now here we find another horror trope. We take our horror villain and we establish what they're supposed to not be able to do or what their kryptonite is. Sometime towards the end of the movie, horror is created by breaking that facade. We cut back to the kitchen where we see the handle of the door slowly turning and eventually opening, establishing that the element of safety has been torn down. Now we know that the threat is three raptors instead. The first raptor in begins calling out to the other raptors to follow suit, and we get the classic raptor scene in the kitchen. The scene plays out as Grant, Ellie, and the kids try rebooting up the computer system of the park while holding off the raptors from getting inside the control room, ending in a nail-biting, near-death action escape through the ceiling while raptors knock down the door and Lex leaving her hanging as the raptor is jumping at her feet. This all leads to the final showdown with them being cornered by the pack of raptors only to be saved by their first dangerous encounter, the T-Rex. A dinosaur on dinosaur battle, ending horror with action. Tension in Jurassic Park isn't built from the typical way you'd see action films structured. Its foundation is horror first, almost through and through, and the action almost always becomes secondary. Horror comedies weren't necessarily hyper popular during this era of film, but Jurassic Park could be considered one of the first of that ilk. 
And by that, I mean first to break through into the mainstream of film culture, not necessarily first ever. Sure, it helps that at the time, Jurassic Park CGI work found a way to create creatures that simply don't exist, that we'd never run into in a groundbreaking, at the time seemingly realistic way. But as all good horror is, Jurassic Park is another movie, like Spielberg has said a thousand times, that was built in the editing room. Spielberg and his team painstakingly put to film a masterclass on how to build a movie that both lives and breathes within multiple genres. It successfully immerses the viewer within a setting that you could never be in, and still grounds it in enough character moments to feel truly terrified by what's on screen. A lot of horror is either based on the unknown or on what we do know, becoming something we don't. Jurassic Park is kind of both of those things, in both concept and in genre. So what does that mean? Well, oh, it essentially means that the rules of genre are meaningless, that the rules of paper and brushes is meaningless. It means create what you want to create, regardless of the confines that art itself wants to put you within. Because most of the time, those confines don't come from what you create, they come from the people looking at them. And art should be for you, just like Jurassic Park was almost certainly for one guy named Steven Spielberg. Well guys, that's it for today's video. As always, if you enjoyed it, press the like button down below. Also hit subscribe so you don't miss anything. And on your screen right now should be two more episodes of Nostalgic, so you can click on those to stay here. And well, I hope to see you guys in the next video.